on this episode of China Unscripted, hostage diplomacy in Cold War II. What the case of Meng Wanzhou and the two Michaels says about the New World Order. Welcome to China Unscripted. I'm Chris Chap. I'm Shelley Zhang. And I'm Matt Ganesha. And our guests today are Fen Hampson, the Chancellor's Professor at Carleton University and President of the World Refugee and Migration Council, and Mike Blanchfield, the International Affairs Writer for the Canadian Press. They are the authors of the book, The Two Michaels, Innocent Canadian Captives and High Stakes Espionage in the U.S.-China Cyber War. Thank you very much for joining us today. Great to be with you. Thanks, guys. In your book, you kind of talk about the differences between the arrests of Michael Koverg and Mac- Michael Spaver versus Meng Wanzhou. Uh, what is the significance of that? I think a great deal of planning and preparation went into, or, or transparent planning and preparation went into the arrest of, um, of Meng Wanzhou. Um, and it generated, I guess, that, like a, a huge um, sort of public trail of information, of video, of court transcripts, documents. Uh, it was a public record, eventually. I mean, not the actual takedown itself, but even that became a matter of public record later on. There all these videos of her uh, questioning in the airport and sort of this real life, um, you know, voiceless drama that was sort of unfolding like, you know, security camera stuff. Whereas the two Michaels just sort of disappeared. You know, I remember working as a reporter in Ottawa during this story and, uh, you know, it just appeared as an email, I think maybe from like, foreign affairs department saying that uh, Canadians missing or one Canadian missing. And then a few days later it was the second Canadian, even though it seems like this all happened pretty much simultaneously. So um, that's sort of the contrast there. Why do you think they, they chose the two Michaels? Was it just like a situation where like the Communist Party sees, oh, they've arrested Meng Wanzhou. Quick, let's arrest some Canadians. Uh, who do we choose? These guys, boom. Well, there was a nine-day gap between the arrest of Meng and then uh, the two Michaels. And in, in the intervening time, uh, tempers flared. Chinese government was very upset. Policy experts, foreign affairs experts warned, oh, there's going to be retaliation. Watch out. And eventually that did appear to happen, obviously. And um, as we explain in the book, too, I mean, these two people lived really sort of interesting lives that were tied to China. They were on the ground. They happened to be there. Uh, there was sort of a, a North Korea connection to their work. Uh, and, um, you know, it's been suggested that, you know, there was a good sort of uh, good set of information to be used by someone that would want to say that, you know, make a, you know, sort of a, an allegation that these two Michaels were spies and that they were doing something that they weren't. And they were just there, I guess. If I could uh, just add to that, um, it's important to bear in mind when the arrest takes place. It takes place uh, during the G20 summit that's uh, being held in Buenos Aires, Argentina. And it occurred almost the same time that uh, G20 leaders uh, were having a dinner, being wined and dined by their host. And at that dinner, uh, Justin Trudeau was there. President Trump was there. Uh, from all reports, uh, you know, uh, notwithstanding the fact that the U.S. and China were in a big trade war, um, he'd had a really good dinner uh, with uh, President Xi Jinping of China. They were getting along. It was all very friendly. Uh, Trudeau was, uh, uh, you know, uh, getting along uh, as well. Um, he'd, he'd been to uh, uh, China earlier to uh try to launch trade talks that hadn't gone very well. But in the interim period, uh, Canada had organized a whole series of ministerial visits. And, um, you know, the next thing you know, um, you know, one of uh, China's leading ladies is being uh, detained uh, on extradition charges in Vancouver Airport. And, uh, uh, you know, what we've heard is that... um, when the uh, U.S. president uh, was told about this, uh, I guess it was the next morning, Mike, uh, at breakfast, he, 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 he got it that, you know, this wouldn't be taken very kindly by, uh, by the Chinese. Uh, 
uh, leader who he just had dinner with. And, you know, this was sort of publicly embarrassing China on the world stage um, with, uh, you know, this very high profile arrest. And I think, um, you know, it's, it's fair to say, you know, Canada was seen by the Chinese as being culpable. Um, you know, as, as being in cahoots uh, with, uh, with the Americans. And, uh, and so, um, you know, the way it was described uh, to us, uh, you know, by, uh, by a, uh, an unnamed uh, Canadian official was, you know, the Chinese, uh, you know, minions around uh, the president uh, of China figure they got to do something to, you know, teach those Canadians a lesson. And, uh, you know, perhaps the best way to do it is to go after some, you know, high profile, reasonably high profile uh, guys who are, you know, doing doing business in, in China. And I- important to remember that Michael Kovrig was a Canadian diplomat who was on leave from the government of Canada to work with the International Crisis Group. So he would have been on the Chinese radar big time. Um, you know, as, uh, you know, as a former, former diplomat, but, but, uh, but still, you know, uh, you know, he hadn't, uh, he hadn't handed in his resignation. So, so I think it's, you know, it's fair to say, um, you know, the boss was mad and the guys around the boss say, are saying, you know, we got to do something, you know, to, uh, to make the boss happy and what better way to stick it to those Canadians than to, uh, arrest a bunch of Canadians, uh, you know, who we, who we know are, um, you know, uh, uh, doing, you know, not for profit work, uh, in, in, uh, in China and North Korea. Mike, you had mentioned that people had said that there would be retaliation, but did it seem like the Canadian government was surprised by the form of the retaliation, by the fact that they arrested the two Michaels? Yeah, I think it's fair to say that when it happened, sure. And um, and the one thing I know that I, is that after it happened, there was a real sense of um, not wanting to do do any harm to these guys, and it was it was uncharted territory for any government, really. I mean, not that you know people a bit people get detained and these 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 things have happened before, but I think it caught the Canadian government particularly off guard in this case. And I think it really led to this whole sort of desire that we outlined in the book to this, okay, we're going to play by the rules here. We're going to play by our rules. We're going to let the court case happen. We're going to give this person due process. We're going to talk to the Chinese about it and try to dial down the, you know, the anger. Um, but there was anger. I mean, there was anger on both sides as well. And that was really clear, um, you know, months later when um, Canada appointed a new ambassador to China, a guy named Dominic Barton. We describe him in the book, and he was a very high-powered international business executive. Lots of former head of McKinsey, McKinsey, yeah, big company, yeah, McKinsey, yeah. yeah, managing director. You know, real big wheel in business. He advised the Canadian government, the Liberal Trudeau government, on economics. He worked for their, you know, did some advice, advisory work for their finance minister. So he was known to the government. So they they sent him to China to basically try to fix this and keep links open. And as Barton has described publicly, and it's in the book and great detail, uh, it was just a big, heated, emotional blow up when he first walked into the room. The Canadian side vented, the Chinese side vented, and, you know, Chinese, you know, re- repurposed all their criticisms. You know, you were a toady of the United States and you should have known better. And anyway, Barton described it, you know, as one of the most uncomfortable meetings he's ever had. And from that point, things kind of dialed down. I think as this, as this kind of went on, uh, I don't think anyone expected that there would be this legal process that took place in Canada that just went on and on and on. Um, because I think that, I mean, I'm just going to surmise that both sides would have thought, okay, maybe there's a way to get out of this sooner rather than later. Uh, and uh, and eventually it did happen with political intervention really from the United States. But um, um, the whole, the whole, the whole, like, metaphor for me for all of this and i and as i've said i've covered this since day one uh you know i went to china with the canadian prime minister a year before this happened and i've covered you know the attempt to get trade talks between china and the and canada 
but just since failed, I've talked to Chinese government officials because why? Because you have to, right? Uh, I, I think people wanted wanted to put this behind them, but it just became like this slow boil, where you know that, that you know, metaphor, you know, that you put the frog in water and simmer it slowly. They don't realize it, and then they're fried. Whereas you, you throw someone in a pot of boiling water, or if, you know, frog the frog in the boiling water, they'll jump out. And I mean, eventually, it just came to the point where it had to get resolved, and it did, as we now know. But um, it was basically unprecedented. Canada felt extremely kind of isolated on the world stage. Donald Trump wasn't exactly their best friend. Other things were going on in the relationship. Um, so they reached out to other allies, tried to get some support. It took a lot, took a while, but it, it got going. But um, I mean, no one really, I mean, it was sort of, I mean, yeah, there have been hostage takings before in different contexts and no one had really, no one in Canada anyway had really well, I think Canadians, like Canadians, you know, sort of think of themselves as being uh, nice people and, you know, they would never do anything like this to us. There's, there's a bit of naivete there. And I think uh, it's also fair to say that, you know, there were, there were cer- certainly, you know, great expectations when Justin Trudeau was elected prime minister of Canada that um, based on, you know, comments he'd made during the election that, you know, China was going to be our new best friend. And, um, uh, you know, the Chinese uh, certainly remember his father, Pierre Elliott Trudeau, who was, um, uh, you know, one of the first uh, Western leaders to, uh, to formally recognize China uh, back in, what was it, uh, Mike, 1970, 71. And, um, you know, Trudeau, the elder Trudeau had, you know, met with Cho and Lai. he met with Mao Zedong, um, uh, and, and, you know, there was, there was, uh, you know, a real sense that, you know, China, we were, go- we were finally going to do serious business with China. China was kind of, uh, Canada was kind of late in the game when it came to, um, you know, doing business with, uh, the new China. And so there were high expectations. And so I think this really caught people off guard and, and the arrest was not, um, this was conducted by, you know, what we would call lower level officials. I mean, the senior leadership of the country was not consulted on it. Our foreign ministry was not consulted about this. Um, uh, you know, it was just, uh, you know, Justice Department and uh, RCMP and other people kind of, oh, well, we've got this extradition request. Uh, we'd better, uh, you know, we'd better uh, arrest her when she comes through uh, Vancouver Airport. So, so I think, uh, you know, if we were to replay this picture again um, and, uh, you know, there'd been senior uh, political involvement, uh, they might have played it quite differently. You know, Mike, you had mentioned that the Chinese officials uh, called Canada, you know, toadies of the United States. So as Canadians, how do you guys feel about being toadies of the United States? <laughs> Well, we're not toadies. We're the little mouse that gets rolled over by the elephant to torture that long time metaphor that uh, Fen probably remembers who first used it, but it gets repurposed from time to time. Uh, Justin's father said, living with the United States is like a, mi- a mouse sleeping with an elephant. I'd change the metaphor. It's more <laughs> like a beaver sleeping with an elephant. But... Why a beaver? It's a c- c- Canadian. Oh, okay. It's our national symbol. One of our national cliches, yeah. It's our national animal. And you see a beaver and you think, damn. <laughs> the mighty beaver, noble. It's interesting about this whole Trudeau father-son thing. I mean, I was in the room when Justin Trudeau, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, met Xi Jinping for the first time. And he it was in 20, late 2015. He had just been elected. He was on his first foreign trip. I think it was like a G20 summit in Turkey at some resort that had been you know, that had been turned into a high security zone, a huge delegation of people, a bunch of people on one side of the table, a bunch of people on the other side of the table. And the words out of you know, the Chinese leader's mouth or as translated to us were, it was basically, we are happy to meet the son of the man who engaged with China. And we were happy to try to, you know, engage with you and move forward. And I mean, and let's face it, you know, at that time, and, and still even now, everybody in some way has to do business with China. You can't, <laughs> It's there. It has to be done business with. Every government has to have a way to move forward on that. Uh, So there was a real expectation that the table had been reset between Canada-China relations um, on both sides, including the Chinese. 
you know, an, an interesting aspect of this that I that I've seen firsthand is um, the Chinese were jet were were really really offended and hurt that the country of you know, Pierre Trudeau, Norman Bethune, who was this you know doctor who you know saved Chinese people, he's revered as a national hero in China. You know, he was, he all, was with Mao on his long march uh, through China, yeah. and um, you know attended to a lot of wounded uh, compadres of, uh, of uh, Chairman Mao. And there was this sense that uh, somehow this nice little country of Canada had knifed them in the back, like giant China. So there was real indignation on that front. And, uh, and of course, the Chinese are sophisticated to know that this was an American move on them uh, through Canada. Uh, hence, you know, the, you know, you're a bunch of toadies and lapdogs and I think lapdog is an, an actual word that got used. It's been used by them in the foreign ministry. And, you know, or maybe running dogs, running dogs of the American imperialists, something like that. No, well, they use the term lapdogs, lapdogs, yeah. Lapdog was the one, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so it, it, it turned everything on its head, um, and, and that's what happened. Well, so I'm curious, since ultimately the United States had responsibility for this, why was China's anger focused pretty much exclusively on Canada. Why do you think they didn't try and kidnap two American citizens? Well, that, um, that, that, that's actually a, 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 a good question. Uh, I think um, they deal with the United States differently than they deal with small powers. And so, um, you know, if Canada had been looking at our uh, Pacific uh, uh, friend, uh, Australia, and seeing how uh, China has dealt with Australians, um, you know, including Australian businessmen who kind of run afoul uh, oh, yeah. uh, of, uh, of Chinese authorities, they they throw them in throw them in jail without uh, uh, compunction. Uh, you know, I think they were smart enough to realize that if they'd um, you know gone after, let's say, some prominent American businessmen who happened to be in in China that, um, you know, they were already on the upward escalatory ladder in a trade war and it would have just uh, gotten much worse because, you know, you, the United States can stick it to China. You're sticking it to China right now. It's one of the reasons, you know, why tariffs, uh, which are still in place under the Biden administration that uh, were uh, introduced by Donald Trump haven't, haven't been lifted, are taking quite a bite out of uh, China's economic apple. And so, uh, you know, Canada was kind of seen as being, as Mike said, uh, duplicitous here. You know, the Chinese don't understand that there are things called extradition treaties and that you've got to, you've got to honor them when you're uh, a neighbor and, uh, and an ally. Um, and, you know, it's not up to Canada to decide on the merits of, uh, of a legal case that the Justice Department has brought against a foreign official who happens to be passing through our airport and the Americans want to have uh, arrested uh, so or extradited. Uh, so in this case, she can stand trial in the United States. So, you know, that you, you don't you don't have a choice, generally speaking, uh, you know, in, a, in an extradition case. And, and so, you know, Canada's defense uh, you know, for its actions all along is, you know, this this has been kind of the rule of law here. Didn't Canada, wasn't, weren't they going to negotiate an extradition treaty with China? That was on the table um, prior to all of this. And yep. it, uh, well, it wasn't really on the table. The Chinese wanted it on the table and the Canadian government insisted that it wasn't on the table. It, it never happened, but uh, the Chinese wanted it. Yeah. Because there, there are quite a few Chinese dissidents and those, and you know, prominent Chinese who, you know, run afoul of Chinese authorities who, you know, come come to Canada and and are here. So, well, so you mentioned rule of law. Uh, this is something we kind of talked about on on our shows, talking about the two Michaels. The, the idea that you know, in democracies, we have uh, rule of law. In China, they have rule by law, where you know, laws essentially serve political purposes. It seemed like the Chinese Communist Party had a really hard time understanding that in Canada, in America, there's the rule of law. You can't just release somebody because it's diplomatically convenient. Do you think there was like, because of those fundamental differences in how law work, do you think there was just like heads butting up against each other with that? 
it's an interesting, really interesting point you've, you've honed in on there. And um, the Chinese understand our legal system as well as we do, if not better. And as we outline in the book, a former attorney general, uh, justice minister of Canada, went to China to try to help, you know, get these guys out. And, uh, and the Chinese government came back and said, well, listen, you know, your law, your extradition, you know, law has um, the ability of uh, political ministers to exercise their discretion. As you know, section 23.3, the Chinese said, why don't you use that and just, you know, have your minister walk into a courtroom and use their legal authority and put an end to this. And it was, it's, it was kind of presented to us by Alan Rock and you know, it's in, it's in the book. It's sort of one of these law and order moments where the lawyer on one side of the table realizes, Oh yeah, they got us. They, uh, they found our, mm. on our legal Achilles heel there. We, we, we knew that one might be coming and boy, they sure did their homework. Um, mm. So there was, that was an element of it, but then there's, as I'm sure Fenn can describe, there's a whole overlay of politics on top of that and how it's, how these things get executed and, you know, how, how you, how you move forward from, from something like that. Executed may be a poor choice of words when we're talking about how China executes law. Uh, well, so Fenn, what do you think about that? Well, I think, you know, the Chinese are as capable as anybody else of, uh, you know, reading, our extradition laws and, you know, seeing if there's an opportunity for a political intervention, uh, which there is. And in fact, there was quite an active debate in the country as these two guys were kind of languishing in jail, uh, you know, by uh, some people, including uh, former Justice Minister Alan Rock saying, you know, particularly given, uh, you know, COVID, these guys are really at risk as, you know, uh, in in jail, um, you know, we should just, you know, bring this whole thing to an end. And, um, uh, you know, the justice minister should uh, exercise his authority to say, you know, this, this case has become too political uh, and we're going to end it. We're going to put her on a plane, uh, send her home, and uh, the Chinese uh, uh, will uh, return these two guys who are, you know, innocent captives. Others felt, and obviously including our prime minister, that um, uh, you know there was uh, uh, a legal uh, uh, process underway in the extradition hearings that were taking place before a, um, uh, a, a British, uh, uh, sorry, British Columbian uh, uh, justice of the British Columbia Supreme Court, uh, and um, you know the government wasn't going to interfere in that process. It was going to let it run its course. And, uh, and um, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, it, it, it almost did until uh, uh, a deferred prosecution agreement uh, uh, was uh, concluded uh, uh, in, in the United States that allowed uh, Meng to go free. But with, with that sort of, you know, getting into the legalities of it, I think there was a strong sense in Canada that, um, um, you know, the government wasn't going to intervene for, um, you know, political reasons. Um, the government had come under criticism, actually, in a in a, a case involving one of our major companies that had been looking for a deferred prosecution agreement. And that had kind of blown up uh, in uh, uh, on the political stage. And so, um, you know, there was no way that uh, the government of Justin Trudeau was going to touch this one with a barge pole, to be honest. Uh, and I think there was also a recognition that, that if they did intervene and do what some were arguing, that the um, Trump administration, which, um, you know, there have been very difficult uh, negotiations for the new NAFTA taking place. Uh, we had uh, aluminum and steel uh, tariffs uh, that the U.S. had put on uh, Canadian uh, producers. It's a you know major industry in Canada that um, you know this wouldn't l be looked on very kindly by Washington. So uh, you know they they were kind of between a rock and a hard place, and I think the sense was you know we have no reason to intervene here. We're going to let uh, uh, the rule of law run its course, and um, you know if. If Meng and her lawyers in uh, Vancouver don't like the outcome, they can appeal it and it can go all the way to the Supreme Court. And this thing could have gone on for years. Meanwhile, the two Michaels would have, you know, sat, sat in jail in, in China, uh, uh, subject to the vagaries of the Chinese legal system. 
I'm saying is there was a political calculation there too. So. Well, so it's interesting that you mentioned that like at the time, public opinion in Canada had turned against China, whereas before it seemed like there was a, a desire to, you know, strengthen the Canadian-China relationship. Right. There was public, I mean, in terms of public opinion, you're absolutely right. I mean, it didn't, it, you know, it's been tracked and it has kind of uh, it's turned negative. Um, but public opinion was also divided in Canada about what to do about these, about the situation. There were a lot of people, I don't know the polls in front of me, but there, I mean, there was, a, I mean, it was, it was fairly divided. There, there, were, there were many. Very divided. Of- yeah. But 50, 50, more or less, because, you know, a lot of Canadians were looking at the human rights situation in China. They were looking at what was going on in Hong Kong. They were looking at, you know, the threats that the Chinese were, uh, you know, levying against Taiwan. Um, the Uyghur situation. And so, you know, there was a real, you know, ambivalence, um, you know, some saying, well, we got to deal with China as it is, we got to trade with it. And others saying, hey, wait a minute, you know, we shouldn't, right? Um, we, we can't sell our principles and our values. Uh, uh, when it not comes even, to and, and even beyond that, we can't, we, let's not break our own rules. We've created these rules, we've created the system, we're going to play by these rules and, uh, and see where it goes. It's pretty tough on the, you know, on the two Michaels and their families. It was, it was brutal. It was. And they, you know, they, you know, they pushed hard um, and tried to basically push the line that uh, let's find a legal, moral pathway to negotiating into this. And they've, they pushed that hard for a long time. And eventually it, uh, it, it worked, it, it developed that way. And it was, Basically, because I think the, you know the, the new Biden government, new Biden administration decided that it was in its interest to push this, to play this. I mean, wh- one of the things that's kind of interesting is you can kind of see this as a play, uh, you know, a narrative where you know it's our rule of law versus the Chinese rule of law, and it's a standoff. One of the people we interviewed was uh, General Spalding, who worked in the White House until Trump fired him. You know, his his view, which uh, is kind of interesting, is that Meng and the two Michaels is is really the first hostage, major hostage crisis of the new Cold War between China and the United States. And, you know, it's not a battle about the rule of law. I mean, as he said, and we quote him in the book, he said, we don't respect the Chinese rule of law and they don't respect our rule of law. And so this was a classic at the end of the day, you know, it should have been seen, um, you know, as kind of a classic hostage exchange, you know, kind of like Gary Powers after the U2 incident. Uh, you probably remember that uh, from the history books. You know, he was the, the, the guy who flew that U2 plane that went into Russian space and was shot down and he wasn't killed. Uh, uh, he was arrested by the Soviet uh, Soviet authorities, and um, you know, eventually traded um, for uh, some Ameri- uh, for some uh, you know Russian spies, and and in some ways, I mean, that's kind of how it played out. I mean, it played out as a hostage exchange, um, and so you know, in some ways, in many ways, I think um, you know, Spalding kind of nailed it, and uh, and you know, what he also said was. You know, if you're going to deal with the new China, you know, there are probably going to be more of these in the future, just as there were during the Cold War, right? Lots of hostage exchanges. Um, And, you know, the battle isn't uh, over saying our rule of law stands versus your rule of law. Um, You know, it's uh, it's fighting the Chinese on, you know, the space of, uh, you know, on the playing field of cybersecurity, you know, keeping them out of the... North American market, uh, new technology, new 5G uh, cellular technology. I mean, you know, he said that's where the game is. I mean, you know, this this stuff is, he, did, he didn't exactly say it's nonsense, but, you know, you have an obligation to bring these people back and, uh, and uh, you know, you trade Meng for that. It's, it's interesting you bring up the, the hostage swaps during the Cold War. And I, I see what you're saying or what Spalding is saying, but at the same time, um, you know, those were people were the you are exchanging spies, but Moanjo is a businesswoman, and right, 
the Michaels are not spies, according to everybody except the Chinese government. Right. So is this a more worrying thing if this if this continues to happen in the future are, are just ordinary people i mean i guess you could say that michaels aren't exactly ordinary people but they neither of them at the time had official government position etc get involved in this yeah i mean it's i mean there i mean this happens in other places i mean one of the most extreme examples that we saw while we were working on the book this past summer there was this um ryanair flight um over Europe, and it contained, uh, you know, pro-democracy enemies of the authoritarian regime of Belarus. They scrambled their air force, and they brought the plane down in Belarus and brought these guys into custody. I mean, that was just an extreme, I mean, an extreme, the most extreme example of what scenario you're just describing, like the next steps. I mean, the, the Michaels were pulled out of their hotels or off a street or out of a restaurant. Who knows? I mean, maybe one day they'll tell us, but um, whereas, you know, we saw, I mean, this whole, um, sense that, uh, you know, Joe Biden called the, uh, the Michaels when he first met with, with our prime minister Trudeau after he, be, after Biden became president, he called them bordering ships, you know, in this whole, you know, thing. And, and that's, and that's basically the challenge for Western governments now is to try to adjust to these new rules, uh, try to create some momentum against it somehow, either political or shame it somehow, or find a political way to put an end to it. But uh, I mean, it, it's a live issue. I mean, people can get picked up and used as hostages. Uh, and it's not the same as the Cold War where, you know, I'm grabbing your spy, you're grabbing my spy, and we swap them. It's not the same, but it is, there, I mean, there's a there's a certain parallel there that Spalding made, which is interesting. Well, in the, in, in the 21st century, ordinary citizens are, are, uh, are poker chips. Um, and, um, you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, people should, should be worried, right? Uh, they should be worried. A Canadian, uh, businessman going to China should be worried because, um, you know, the, the old rules don't apply. It's actually one of the reasons why the Canadian government, when they were sort of trying to figure out how to deal with this, um, uh, introduced a resolution. I think they've got what 65 countries now, something like that, who've signed on to it. Uh, you know, basically saying um, this kind of uh, behavior isn't on. Um, we don't uh, approve of it. I think the next step is to say, and okay, if you if you play this kind of game, we're going to subject you to sanctions. We're going to penalize you. Um, you know, when when that you know, plane went down uh, or was taken down in, in Belarus and, and those people were taken off. Um, you know, there, there wasn't the sense of outrage that there should have been. Um, you know, we could have gone after, there are five banks in Belarus that account for something like 70% of fi all financial transactions in that country. We should have put sanctions on them and said, you know, you play this game, you are going to really pay for it. Instead, it was kind of a slap on the wrist. So I think, you know, part of the challenge for Western democracies is to get serious here when this kind of thing happens, you know, because, you know, if you're going to do business um, and you want to do business, um, you know, everyone is at risk. The Australians have discovered that. Other countries have discovered it. And I would say, um, you know, um, it, it will happen to Americans as well, and it does happen to Americans. I mean, I think there's always this fear among Western countries of having a bad relationship with China, this fear of angering China, uh, as if like, if a country, if a Western country were to do that, then that country would face some sort of major crisis uh, and of course, of course, we want to have friendly relations with everybody, right? But then there are consequences to that, right? Well, I'd, I'd sort of put it the other way around. I mean, I, I'd, I'd say, you know, if China wants to continue to do business with the West and to attract, you know, Western investment and to sell its goods and services and to be part of global value chains, they got to play by these rules too, right? You know, that, you know, that, extends into, you know, other kinds of uh, comportment as well. You know, you, you know, when it comes to, you know, stealing 
intellectual property and trade secrets and cyber attacks. I mean, it's, uh, you know, that's, that's all contributing to, you know, what we would call um, difficult, uh, you know, difficult and, and fractious uh, relations. And, and, you know, you're right um, that, that um, uh, you know, and I think it's certainly been true in Canada, there's, you know, been a desire not to rock the boat too much with China. Um, you know, t- when we're upset about human rights to use so-called quiet diplomacy, you know, not to take the megaphone uh, so that, um, you know, we can continue to do business with China. But, but um, you know, I think China of today, and, you know, this is fairly, fairly obvious, uh, you know, is, is very different, uh, you know, from uh, uh, China of 20 years ago. And, um, and it's, um, it's flexing its muscles in all kinds of ways. And I think, you know, this, this whole episode is yet another manifestation uh, of that. Do you think, because, you know, what you said, Fen, is absolutely right in that China should be facing some consequences if they want to behave this way uh, and they should be facing consequences um, for all the things you talked about, but it doesn't really seem that they are facing a lot of negative consequences now. In in your reporting for the book, did you guys find that um, China had faced a lot of negative consequences for what they did to the two Michaels? Nothing that had any bite. Um, and um, I mean, and just getting back to this um, Fen alluded to just a moment ago, it was, it's a declaration on arbitrary detention in state-to-state relations. Very Canadian. Mouthful. <laughs> yeah. So Canada went around, you know, Canada needed support. They needed other countries to step up and say, hey, what they did to the Michaels is bad. Help us out. Talk, speak out. So they got 50, 50 up to like 65 countries now, including the U.S., saying, yeah, this is a bad thing. Uh, you can't take pot. You can't do this. And the, a lot of the other countries signed on were... Yeah, we're signing on because North Korea grabbed a bunch of our people or Russia's taken some of ours and and you know, so they did this declaration. It's very it's a very sort of typical, almost quintessential Canadian move on the world stage. We try to bring a bunch of people together and create something new. I mean, this was done out of pure necessity, political necessity. This time it was the Canadian government you could go and find some friends and some allies and kind of put it together that way. The parallel is, you know, 30 years ago, Canada tried spearheaded this landmines treaty to ban landmines, which got a lot, of, eventually got a lot of support, and it created this stigma. Even though the U.S. didn't sign the treaty, be that as it may, it created the stigma that landmines are bad, they're evil, they, you know, they maim and dismember children and turn them into, you know, paraplegics and all of that. So this is this is part of an effort to to say to start a movement that says it's really bad to kidnap people through your political ends to try to, you know, leverage a, a state-to-state negotiation or get do better in a trade deal or whatever, you know, or get my court case dropped against my national in another country. Uh, and the problem with it is there's no real sanction. There's no real teeth to it yet. I mean, this could evolve into something that, you know, turns into, yeah, it'll be automatic sanctions, becomes an actual treaty. It tries to stamp this stuff out. Who knows? But that's... Uh, and, and China just laughs at this. They just scoff at it and say, yeah, you've got 50 countries and there's another 50 that didn't sign it. And most of them are, you know, are too chicken to do it. But but I'd, I'd also say that, you know, China has been, you know, try, trying to promote its uh, so-called soft power credentials. And uh, when President Xi Jinping, um, you know, went before, you know, the General Assembly uh, earlier this year in September, actually just, just before this whole thing was... Uh, more or less resolved. You know, he gave, you know, a speech that, you know, talked about, you know, China is committed to a rules-based order as being, uh, you know, a uh, uh, supporter of, uh, you know, the world order, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and, and I think, um, you know, this, this case, because, you know, in part because, you know, Canada and our diplomats kept, you know, beating the drum. We got other countries, uh, you know, it, it, it was raised at, you know, every G7 meeting. It was raised in other forums. It really, I think, you know, the Chinese uh, realized that, hey, this isn't helping our image at all. And we also have something called the Beijing Olympics coming up. And, um, you know, it'd be nice to kind of clear the deck 
before that happens. Now, you know, we've just heard, um, you know, that um, a very famous Chinese uh, tennis player uh, has been arrested and disappeared for, uh, you know, allegations against uh, uh, a senior member of the, uh, uh, you know, the Chinese leadership, you know, and, and there, the international uproar, I think it does kind of get through, um, uh, you know, does it mean that, you know, the, the Chinese tiger, if I can use that metaphor, is going to change its stripes? Uh, probably not, but, but I think they're, they're, you know, it, it, it does have some effect. And certainly in this case, I think it did have some effect in terms of, you know, trying to get a resolution uh, to the crisis. And, and the reason I would say that is that when the deferred prosecution agreement was reached, there was a lot of speculation in Canada that, you know, the Chinese would keep the two Michaels in jail for another, you know, couple of months. It would take a while. Um, you know, they would allow some of the court processes that had been started to continue. You know, many, many close China watchers said, oh, yeah, it's going to take, it's going to be several months. I mean, uh, um, uh, and, uh, you know, maybe longer. Uh, and I think everyone was struck by the speed at which, um, you know, I mean, the, the two Michaels were released simultaneously. Um, and I think that that kind of underscores that, you know, the, the Chinese and the Chinese leadership had kind of had enough of this one. And, and you know, we're quite happy to see, uh, you know, that problem go away. Um, not, there's still other problems there, but, but I think they do care about their soft power reputation. Um, because they understand, you know, that that is the greatest source of American power in the world is its soft power. It's not just its military power, it's its soft power. So they understand the importance of that. Maybe the Chinese Communist Party released the two Michaels so quickly so they could show the world the strength of socialism with Chinese characteristics. I have to say, I was surprised. It's, it's, they're, they're so efficient. We should adopt their system. Yeah. I, I, I was surprised that it was pretty much a simultaneous release. It's, it also kind of gives up the game, right? I mean, they could have done like some legal process, but they didn't even think that that was important. I, or, I mean, on the Amer on the Canadian on the North American side, the Americans went. I mean, there were two there was two simultaneous court appearances, and one in Brooklyn. Americans basically dropped the charges. They you know, retool us into this deferred prosecution agreement, which just be I mean, now not a person, and. Three hours later, in a Vancouver courtroom, the Canadian uh, prosecutors walk in <laughs> and tell this judge hours and hours and months and just endless, you know, hearings and stacks of legal documents filed that, you know, all of us have had to read and testimony we've had to listen to, uh, saying, oh, we're done. We're just pulling the plug now. The Americans don't want her anymore. And then she's on an airplane within two and a half hours and literally at the same moment, Plane is taking off. I mean, and I, you know, and I've, you know, I, with a straight face, you know, the best of intentions, I've asked Chinese officials, well, you know, is there a deal to be had here? And what would happen? Every reporter in Canada that's ever had a chance to attend a press conference with a, you know, a Chinese diplomat asks the same question. And the question is always, you know, the answer was always, no, 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 we have our process, you have your process, release Madam Meng now because you bunch of American lapdogs, you shouldn't have arrested her in the first place. And then boom. Everyone gets what they want and literally wheels up in two different continents, literally a minute apart. And to make the point, the Canadian prime minister didn't announce this to the Canadian public. He did it late on a Friday night with like almost zero notice to, to, to reporters who to, to would want to go there and actually cover it because he wanted to make sure the government of Canada wanted to make sure that that plane that was carrying the Michaels was, was out of Chinese airspace one final time was being you know accompanied by god knows what and uh and that's you know you would have think you would have thought that if a, a canadian prime minister had been able to pull this off you, they would have you know your government does it our government does it every western government does it. hey let's have a communication roll out let's you know blast this no they waited until the first possible moment and the last possible moment and just basically got in front of a tv camera and said they're on their way home and, but and at that moment mung is on her way and within you know within a day she's given a this hero's welcome in, in her, in, in Shenzhen, you know, it's like a uh, red carpet. Literally she walked down and was handed a bouquet. But Michael, we haven't heard anything from her since. Nothing, nada. 
she went back to work actually a few weeks later. And they, yeah, and they, um, yeah, it's, you can find this the video of this. And she, uh, she got like these sang songs and welcomed her. And yeah, I, was, I was a little, I was a little suspicious she might uh, never emerge from her three week quarantine. But she did actually go back to work at least publicly one day. So it was sort of interesting to see that. It is uh, interesting when you when you guys go into the book about Meng's relationship with her father and how uh, you know because I think we assume that she's oh she's the daughter of the the so the head of Ren Zhengfei right yes, yes. yeah okay. yeah yeah it's that she's the daughter of the head of Huawei right and obviously she's quite wealthy and you know she must be very important to him and to the Chinese regime but it seems like that's not it's not so straightforward. Mm -hmm. No, it's 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 straight. It's a it's the plot line of secession, right? I mean, read those memos and read you know the emails that you purportedly said. You know, you're not you're not strong enough to leave my company. I mean, it's, I mean, that he's the patriarch saying, "Sorry, my kid." He said, "My kids aren't good enough to do what I do." That's really got. How, how do you relate to that shit? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, it's it's also like the the Pierre Justin Trudeau relationship, right? You're always living under your father's shadow. Uh, well, I mean, one thing that actually I'm kind of curious for you guys because you've been working on this book was it a surprise that it all wrapped up so quickly? Yes, yes. In fact, the book uh, was literally about to go to press. It uh, we were we were correcting the final page proofs. And I get a call from Mike saying, guess what? <laughs> and uh, so our publisher uh, called us um, and uh, a powwow on a Saturday morning to, uh, you know, discuss, do we, do we pull the book? Uh, you know, do we, uh, you know, wait until we can, you know, do the final story? Uh, Know, and issue it six months from now. Well, fortunately, we were able to get some really, really good interviews with a lot of people who remain unmentioned, but we're happy to kind of tell us what happened. And so, uh, you know, the great thing about writing with a reporter is that they, or journalist, I should say, is that they uh, know how to turn around copy pretty quickly. So we were able to uh, write that final chapter and kind of tell the story of how it happened. So it all worked out in the end, but uh, but it's um, it's not the way you normally as a, certainly as a academic, which I am. It's not the way you normally write a book. <laughs> well, isn't it a little convenient that uh, just as you put out your book, you get a nice nice ending? Suspicious, <laughs> a I'd say. A little too convenient. <laughs> a little too convenient. We yeah. thought we had a pretty good ending, um, which was the second last chapter of the book. Uh, but no, the end. The, the new ending is definitely much. Uh, it's a much better ending. Yeah, and just from a straight commercial point of view, if that had happened two weeks later, you would have been looking at a book that had no true ending, that you would have looked at this and said, well, where's the rest of it? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm. it's lucky for you guys it wasn't actually in print. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, well, we're, we're lucky, uh, uh, fortunately, the, and we're also lucky that the printer, because a lot of books now are printed in China, and in fact, there was a, a ship from China that lost something like 90 uh, um, containers uh, off it, uh, but um, uh, uh, that was going into the port of Vancouver. But uh, fortunately, our publisher cho chose to uh, have this book printed in uh, Saskatchewan uh, with a very good printer there. So uh, good choice. It's why you have a copy on your desk. It's uh, it's made in North America. Uh, speaking of, I, I want to get to this before we run out of time. Um, you know, you mentioned uh, how Xi Jinping talks about, you know, the world order. Uh, you talk a lot about how the story of the two Michaels and Meng, uh, it gets kind of uh, wrapped up into the story of who controls the global Internet. W what do you mean by that? Well, um, what what we mean by that is that, you know, we're we're we're. Um, uh, entering a, a world where um, you know the internet is essentially going to be mobile through uh, through 5G, um, and um, and uh, you know Huawei is one of uh, you know the very big uh, players uh, in uh, telecommunications uh, technology. The two other big companies, hate to tell you this, guys, because I know you're Americans, but uh, it's Nokia, uh, which is uh, 
Finnish company and Ericsson, which is a Swedish company. And they're, they're the other world leaders in, in 5G. And, uh, you know, Huawei has uh, commandeered the, the global market. They've also developed much of the intellectual property for 6G, which is going to be even faster than 5G. Uh, you know, they control something like, you know, uh, 60% of, uh, you know, some of the key patents uh, for that technology. They control a lot of the standards uh, for, um, uh, for uh, wireless uh, technology. And so, um, you know, a, a key part of this story is, um, you know, the battle between the United States and, uh, and uh, uh, China for, um, you know, dominance in, in, in this space, um, uh, you know, which is the cutting edge of everything. Uh, particularly as we move to the Internet of Things, um, you know, 5G is going to be absolutely critical there. And, you know, one of the reasons why, you know, Huawei, which was doing a pretty healthy business in the United States, uh, you know, ran afoul of your Justice Department and your authorities was, you know, they were using their their position here, their beachhead to um, get into into the into your networks and control your networks and. Uh, and, um, you know, they, they were also doing a very healthy business in, in Canada. We, we sort of talk about this in the book. And, um, and you know, they, they weren't uh, always playing above board either. And so we, we talk about that. And that's, that's kind of how this case began was that, you know, Huawei was running afoul of uh, uh, U.S. Uh, authorities um, and, you um, and, um, you know, they were also violating, uh, uh, you know, through their subsidiary, uh, Skylink, um, uh, uh, the um, uh, sanctions against Iran. And so, you know, that's, that's how, how, this, how this happened. So, you know, there's a bigger story here, and we tell it in the book about, about um, you know, Huawei and, uh, and trade wars and, uh, um, and, and yet, you know, as we can see in these kinds of uh, epic battles, there's always, a, a, you know, a, a human dimension. Um, and uh, Mang and the two Michaels are really the human, human aspect of the story. You know, it's, uh, um, and they're in some ways the, the, you know, the two Michaels, the collateral damage in it. Well, it definitely was a, a fascinating book. Uh, we'll we'll put a link to it in the description below on the podcast so uh, viewers can check it out. Thanks so much for joining us again. Congratulations on the book and the you know conveniently timed ending that you guys got. <laughs> yeah, it was all it was all prearranged, but we'll tell you about that some some later. <laughs> yeah, okay, that's that's the next book. <laughs> but yeah, pleasure having you on. Thanks so much. Thank you. Yeah, I, I totally think these guys had something to do with the re resolution of the Meng Wanzhou thing. Because come on, the timing is just too perfect. It's too perfect. It's it's like it's like when uh you know a story you know gets updated right as we're about to finish headlines that week. Uh huh. And it's just it's just perfect timing. Yeah, and you're glad that it didn't get updated like two hours later. Oh yeah. Yeah. To go back and record. You know? Are yeah. we talking about anything in particular? Uh. Yeah, <laughs> some, some oh, it's yeah. never happened. You know, just uh, yeah. that. That is the hard thing about any kind of like coverage of current events. Like, like imagine if this book had come out like a week earlier. Oh that would have been, been like, <laughs> oh boy. Uh, but you know, a lot of a lot of timing things are, are interesting about how things get covered in the media. Like a lot of news or like bad things the Chinese Communist Party does to try to time it like right around Christmas. Yeah. Because reporters are busy and then they arrested Liu Xiaobo on Christmas Day or something like that. Mm. She'd been naughty. Well, I mean Oh Matt. No. That's he he hadn't been. He was Nobel Prize winner. Anyway, go on. Uh well, uh, Matt, you make the point. Uh timing is very important. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, I one thing about the timing of this case that's interesting is um, I think Fen had mentioned that the Biden administration had offered this deferred prosecution deal to Meng Wanzhou, but then it came out that the Trump administration had also offered, the Trump Justice Department had offered this deferred prosecution. 
but she didn't want to take it because it would mean that she had to formally admit guilt. Like she basically had to say that she did the things that the U.S. government was accusing her of, which was misleading, you know, banks about China, uh, about Huawei's, you know, uh, lying basically about Huawei's business deals in Iran. And and she did have to admit some kind of wrongdo wrongdo. She admitted wrongdoing without guilt or something. Well, yeah, she ha- basically that. had to say that she did what the prosecution was uh, of accusing her of. But what happened was she didn't want to do it earlier, and then probably through the months of this long extradition trial that Mike had mentioned that had been dragging on, that she realized that. This is actually going to be harder to get yeah, out of than she thought. The U.S. Mm-hmm. and Canada wouldn't just cave, right? And I felt bad for her because she was holed up at her million-dollar mansion in Canada. Well, I feel a little bad for her because of her relationship with her father. I, I actually, yeah, I do feel bad for her on that count. It is interesting what they were saying about she goes back and then you have to watch whether she comes out again, right? Yeah, because I'm sure the Communist Party was not happy about. Right. Being forced into the situation. And, uh, well, she went back to work officially, but who knows what happens next? Because that's probably the last high profile thing that she really had to do is yeah. officially go back to work, right? For a father who doesn't believe in her. Wow. Anyway, I mean, also probably the two Michaels suffered a little bit. There's actually a lot of detail in the book about, you know, what they went through in prison and how... Uh, I think Michael Kovrig spent the first six months in solitary confinement wow. and they weren't allowed any communication with the outside world at first. They weren't allowed um, books or anything. And then eventually they were allowed books wow. and letters. And that was their only kind of connection to the outside world. I think eventually they got some Chinese cellmates too. So they weren't just in solitary, but it does not sound like a good time. And uh, you know. I, I hope he got to read Xi Jinping's book, The Governance of China, and The Governance of China, Volume 2. I don't remember. It actually lists some of the books that they requested. I don't remember all of them, but I do remember pretty clearly that Michael Kovrig had requested Marcus Aurelius, like the Stoic. <laughs> I, I mean, guess that's very appropriate. Wow. Yeah, right? Meditations. Yeah. 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 Uh, well, hey, speaking of great books to read while you're imprisoned by the Chinese Communist Party, (laughs) (laughs) the two Michaels, check it out. Uh, it is, hey, Madeline Albright says it's a gripping human drama. That's a recommendation. Unless you don't take our recommendation as above Madeline Albright's. Anyways, link is below. Uh, Thanks for watching China Unscripted. I'm Chris Chappell. I'm Shelley Zhang. And I'm Matt Ganesta. I'll talk to you next time.